While most of the discussions that take place in conservatories and university music programs are focused about the, the you know, technical and theoretical underpinnings of music performance, one crucial issue that is often left out is the performance venue. The space that we play in has a huge effect on the reception of the performance, and the best musicians know how to accommodate their performances for the acoustic that they are playing in. Today I'm going to talk to you about how we should be thinking, at least, about adapting our performances for the acoustic qualities of the room that we are going to perform in, both from my own observations as well as those of Johann Joachim Quantz. So, are you ready for this? Yeah, I, I didn't think so. One of the luxuries of being a tenured orchestral player is the fact that most of one's performances take place in the same hall, one that was purpose-built for concert giving. While every concert hall has its own character, especially the older ones, these days the most modern halls are designed to amplify the performers on stage in a way which allows them to play the way that they want. If you're a freelance player or a student, however, you'll be performing in many different venues, each with their own acoustic qualities. For a historical performer like me, much of my work takes place in churches, which can be very different from one another. Big stone cathedrals, such as the Bosler Munster, are very wet acoustics, meaning the sound reverberates over a long duration in the space. Whereas local churches built with a combination of stone or plaster, brick and wood, and with a smaller volume, I mean in cubic meters, temper the reverb. So what does a room with a lot of reverb do to a musical performance? Think of it as if you were trying to hear someone speak in a cathedral from 30 meters away. You can hear the voice projecting, but the consonants and any real detail is muffled to the point that you can't understand what's being said. What did you say? It's no surprise then that a fundamental part of a stage actor's training is in enunciation. What I do is I pretend to be the person I'm portraying in the film or play. Yeah. The same problem applies to musical performance. The further one sits from an instrument that's playing in a large reverberant environment, the less detail one will hear. Articulations will be lost, and if the tempo is too fast, clean runs will sound more like a, a wave of indecipherable notes. Yeah. As performers, do we simply accept that an abnormally wet acoustic will manipulate the musical decisions we make in the rehearsal room? most often to the detriment of the listener? Or should we frame our musical decisions with a mind to deliver the most comprehensible performance? Okay, that's a loaded question, I know. Whatever, here's Quantz. Every musician must adjust not only himself to his powers and capacity, but also to the place where he plays, to his accompaniment or the orchestra, to the circumstances in which he plays, and to the listeners before whom he wishes to be heard. In a large place where there is much resonance, and where the accompanying body is very numerous, great speed produces more confusion than pleasure. Thus on such occasions he must choose concertos that are written in a majestic style, or moderate speed. The echo that constantly arises in large places does not fade quickly, and only confuses the notes if they succeed one another too quickly, making both harmony and melody unintelligible. In a small room, on the other hand, where few instruments are at hand for the accompaniment, the player may use concertos that have gay and galant melodies, or at the fastest tempi, and in which the harmony changes more quickly than at half and whole bars. These may be played more quickly than the former type. So Quantz is explicit in telling us that there are certain styles of music from his day which should be avoided in very wet acoustics, in the interests of delivering a moving performance. But where you are not only dictates what you play, but how you play it. And I found that in order to give a more, or in order to give more clarity to an audience, regardless of the piece or instrumentation of the performance, that one must pay much more attention to articulation. Sharper articulations are softened in a wet acoustic, and shorter note lengths are, well, lengthened. If one can exaggerate a slur, allowing as much space between the groupings as possible, that will also help. In a dry acoustic, 
much more attention has to be paid to the, the shape of each note. That, that is to say, how the color and volume of each note changes over its duration. Ideally, you want to work to replicate the sort of sound that's produced from a performance in a better sounding hall. Once again, I realize that it's hard to really comprehend the issues of acoustics because I'm speaking to you only in this room. While I'd love to go out and do tests for you in churches around town, I don't have anyone to help me lug around all of the equipment I'd need, but also it's not exactly the best time to be out and about. You understand what I'm saying. So I think the most effective way for me to convey to you how I might perform in two extreme acoustics is to play for you the two opening phrases from the bass line of the final Amen in Handel's Messiah. I'm going to do it twice. The first way in which I would perform in a dry acoustic, and the second in which I'd perform in a wet one. I'll also run that second version for a third time and put some post-process reverb into it so that you get an idea of what it might sound like in a wet acoustic. Here we go. <laughs> I know some of you may jump to the conclusion that adding a digital reverb wouldn't be the same thing as a real, you know, a recording in a real place. But after having run a number of different tracks of my own playing through the same system, I've actually been quite impressed at how close to real life it can sound. So what is the key takeaway from this video? That musical decisions are not confined to an extra planar realm. I'm obviously getting a lot of my language these days from Dungeons and Dragons. You've decapitated him. Brutalitops is dead. What? No! What I'm trying to say is that real world issues like the concert space should be incorporated into our musical decision process because ultimately a good performance is judged not by the gods, but by the audience. And if they can't understand what's being done on stage because of the choice of music or how it's performed, then the performance was an unsuccessful one. So that's more food for thought for you. I hope that this video was helpful. If you would like to support these videos, then please consider becoming a patron via Patreon. And don't forget to like on YouTube, share, and subscribe to this channel. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.